In the original video I made on sticks and pads, I basically pointed out how people can win with all sorts of controllers except for maybe a steering wheel. It was basically the safe and responsible message of use what's comfortable to you. But I can't help but feel this advice kind of exists to help steer beginners away from the temptation to blame their controller for their losses. After all, people do this all the time. But the truth is, the type of controller you use can absolutely affect your play and your overall gaming experience, and this is why people who have never really played in arcades wonder if they should spend hundreds of dollars on an arcade stick. But if there's anything we learned about pad players in recent years, is that they're doing well for themselves. Like, really, really well. While there's no need to switch if you're already comfortable on pad, arcade stick culture is pretty awesome because of how customizable everything is. Like the clothes you wear on your body, this kind of customization allows you to express yourself in a genre that celebrates individual achievement, and at the very least, it can show you're someone invested in these games. Even people who use a stick completely in its default form have made choices about the brand and its components. For the case, people have used everything from Xboxes all the way to shoeboxes. Weight and materials are important to make sure they can withstand your inevitable button mashing, and also so that the stick doesn't move around too much. The top of your case can act as a nice big canvas to exhibit your favorite artwork or just something you like. Function-wise, the case determines your button and lever placement. For example, arcade layouts like the Vulex have the lever close to the buttons which likely comes from tabletop machines which didn't have much room, especially for two-player setups. This button placement is good for playing on these six buttons or these six buttons. In contrast, you can also have the Noir setup which puts the lever a little further away and has a button layout that better fits the shape of your fingers as long as you're playing in this position. Placement is especially important for the start button so you don't accidentally push it and forfeit the match. As for button types, you basically want to look for sensitivity, size, and noise levels. Noise levels are important because you either don't want to give away your button presses to your opponent sitting next to you, or you want your opponent to hear your fake button presses to throw them off. If they complain, you can always blame them for listening in on your buttons. If you simply don't want to telegraph what you're doing, you can get silent buttons or play on pad. Though of course, this doesn't stop people from looking at your hands from across. Can't escape from crossing. Another important thing to consider is the board you use. Third-party boards are good because they're sold individually, allowing you to make custom sticks, and are sometimes compatible with consoles of opposing brands. The board I use works on pretty much anything. The downside is that companies can detect third-party boards and cripple their use. Sony puts an 8-minute time limit on unlicensed boards which can ruin you in tournament if you don't consistently update with the latest firmware. Finally, you have many choices of levers, and from my experience, it's one of the parts people are most sensitive about. If you ever want to gross someone out, just offer them a lever they're not used to. I'm fine, I just uh, threw up in my mouth a little bit. At Master Cup in Japan, they even go to the trouble of providing cabinets with Korean levers to accommodate their guests. But the most common type of lever is the ball top with square gate, which is what the Japanese arcades use, and they essentially dominate the stick market. In games with charge characters, this can help you hold down back and easily transition to up back position without losing your back charge. This same maneuver on a circular gate would require you to do a less intuitive crescent shape. But then circular gates allow you to do literal quarter circle motions, which could be more intuitive, especially for beginners trying to throw key blasts. The most dyed in the wool lever users can come up with all sorts of reasons why their lever is the best for their game, but now people are making sticks with no levers at all, and even top players with deep arcade roots are looking into them. <laughs> Some games have not taken into account a controller that can input two opposite directions at the same time, and combo artists like Desk have found game-breaking techniques like walking forward and throwing sonic booms. Things like this, or where the use of these controllers in tournament have been controversial, especially in the Smash community. But a controller with theoretical benefits doesn't help you much if you're not used to playing on it. The question becomes, are the benefits of getting good with another controller type worth spending the time to learn it? For Tekken player Meat, it was because he actually prefers pad for one character and stick for another. JT, what's he playing on pad? What? He's on a stick now? New stick? Maybe he plays uh, Jack on stick? I guess so, Who yeah. Knows? 
This might sound extreme, but remember that some techniques are known to work better on certain setups, like Van Geef's infamous Walking 720 Ultra on pad. Rufus towards that corner. Whoa! That was the Walking 720 he's famous for, doing that on a pad. It's stuff like this that makes it hard to shake the feeling that arcade sticks are becoming relics of the past. But some of the coolest and most valuable things do look old, like vintage guitars, pre-distressed jeans, and pre-distressed vintage guitars. If function and comfort were the only things that mattered, I think there'd be a bigger market for the D-pad arcade combination. Anyways, this was Gerald from Corey Gaming. Thanks for watching.